Okay, so they asked me to talk about changing vital information on family trees, so that's what we are going to cover. Um, interestingly enough, if you logged into Family Search recently, you saw that everything changed. So any slide I had before two weeks ago was no longer relevant. So we had to start from scratch. But um, what we are going to talk about, since all of you know me, I don't really have to introduce myself, right? Um, let's see if we can get this to work, please. Please, it worked before. Let's try that. Let's see if that'll work. There we go. Okay. So the um, scope of what we're going to talk about today is just um, adding vital information to the person page. Um, it will be involving entering names, dates, and places, and some of that has actually changed just in the last couple of weeks. We're going to talk a little bit about databases and systems, but don't let that worry you. And then making changes and corrections, and then my soapbox of standardization, because that's what I um, love. But they have made it easier, so it's kind of more fun to even talk about it now. Um, I'm just going to give a nod to the FH guide. Um, all of you, if you just opened um, Google Chrome, this will come up as the third tab up there on the right. And this is where you can go to find the step-by-step -step information about almost anything that has to do with genealogy. Um, we are going to focus on, um, I just want to draw your attention to this, to the toolbar at the top, and we're going to focus on family search. You can go to Ancestry, MyHeritage to get detailed instructions on how to do things there. But here you go to Family Search, and then you would just click on number one, which is Family Tree, because that's where you'll learn about how to do things in Family Tree. Here, it breaks down the, this is Project 1. You can look through those, but today we're focusing on number six of changing information. Oh, sorry, you know what? He told me to turn that back up and I didn't. Let's see if that works better. Can you hear me? Is that better? Oh, that's really strange. Okay, so then uh, under six, it brings up these choices. So A is update vital information for a person. And so that's the topic that we're going to focus on tonight. And let's see if my thing works. So if you look here, you can scroll down the page on that tab. And any of those um, hyperlinks right there will take you to articles. And there's even a BYU family uh, tree video there that you can go to. And they will have uh, what, what I call white papers, but basically step-by-step -step instructions and information about whatever you're interested in. So I really recommend that you go and click on those and open them up and read them. Then you know where to find information when you have a question about something. And it's, a, it's very much more detailed than we're going to go into tonight, but I want you to know how to find it. For example, one of the topics is correcting a person's name, sex, events, and facts in the Family Tree web app. Perfect. And then down below, you can see where the arrow is. It says steps, and that it'll take you down to those steps there. Another one would be entering names in family tree. Even I learned a little something when I went back and looked at the new one um, where they were talking about Canadian naming customs and how to enter those. And I've come across those but had never really known much about them or thought about it because I hadn't done that much with them. But now I actually know where I can go when I come back to that to look and see specifically how it should be handled in family search. You'll also notice down below um, there's other links, and those, um, when you open one link, you can click on more links if you need more information there as well. So, but what we're covering tonight is vital information, which would be covering name, birth, christening, death, and burial, and then there are additional facts that you can add to any person page. I'd like it if you um, would open up your own personal family page, or person page in Family Search. And you can follow along and practice as we're going along, because we're not going to be doing a lot, and we're going to have some repetition built in there. So you should be able to just practice along on your own, your person, yourself. So the first thing is that we're going to talk about is names. And I love that. What's in a name? Well, sometimes a lot. So if I bring up this, you can see this is um, adding a new person. And these, are, these little boxes are called fields. And fields are important because that's what the computer uses. Now, most people that I know of 
are not born with titles. Now, if you're royalty, you might have a title, but most people aren't. So that generally is left blank, but if you were putting that in other information, then it could be used. The only time that I use a title for somebody in a family as part of their birth name is when there's some, so many people in that family that have the same name, and one of them happened to be in the military and has a title. It just is nice to be able to keep them separated. Sometimes people are afraid to make those changes. Like, I think people get mad at them. I actually have, my husband has an uncle, and every once in a while we'll get to a family reunion thing, and he'll come up. There's a problem in there. This isn't right. I'm like, fix it. <laughs> That's the benefit of it. We all work together so we can fix it. Generally, I go in and fix it. But, um, you know, because if you have more information than somebody else, go ahead and add that information. If you have a record that says more about something, go in and add it. And, um, and so I'm going to show you how we do that. But some of the most important rules for uh, names, I believe, and so I started, you can see they get bigger and then smaller. Um, use the birth name. And I don't care if you don't know the last name of the birth name, then don't put it in there. So the birth name should be what is in that vital name field. If you don't know it, then it's the earliest name that you know. And, or their complete legal name. Um, for women, it's got to be the maiden name. Sometimes I'll look at a tree. I, I see it more in ancestry now than I do it in family search, where somebody will have the, the, the marriage surname instead of the maiden name in the women's field. And it causes problems because the computer says, that's a birth name, that's a maiden name. So when I do a search, I'm looking for a maiden name, not a last name or a marriage name. So I, and some people say, well, I don't know that. It's okay, just take it out. Um, the, you'll notice it says, do not type all capital letters. In the past, when they did things on paper or they typed it, they would put the, the last name in capital letters to help distinguish it from the rest of the name. In the computer-based system, we don't need that. The last name tells us that's the last name. So you can remove any full-cap lettered names um, that are all caps. And then don't use any quotation marks, parentheses, underscore slashes, or other invalid characters. Um, what some people don't realize is those characters actually interact with the search engines for the computer when it's um, doing searches and can affect that and change it. So, so try to take those out as much as possible. Occasionally, I'll come across one that's like, uh, it's going to take a little effort to figure out what, how to deal with that, and I'll leave it. But most of the time, if you have to have a in parentheses, that name that's in parentheses should go down below in other information as an additional name or a nickname or something like that. It does not belong in the vital information record part of it. Um, don't use the word between uh, or between names. In the past, we used to do that. We'd say, well, their name was either this or that. And if you were doing a search on Google, that works. You can put an or in between it, and, and Google knows to look for this or that that the way that they programmed it in family search, it doesn't um, like that as well. So that's, again, you would put that in the or section, or the additional section. And then only use abbreviations if you can't find the full name. So typically you expand it out. But I don't expand it out if it's a name that I can't quite tell what it should be expanded to. I'd rather leave it for what I have documentation for. Whoops. Go back. So I just want to introduce you to John Peter Hart and Isabella N.C. Higginbotham. This is a picture that we actually have in our library at home. It's this big. <laughs> and it's original. And you can tell it's really aged. It's, um, it's very, very old. It's, very, um, it's falling apart pretty much. We're very careful with it. Um, but this is my husband's second great-grandparents. And um, Isabella was born 1854, and she died in 1932. And I just have to thank her for having I really cut my teeth on learning how to understand records and how it works and, and the, how I put information in. Because you would think that her name is really unique. 
It's not. It's the South and the everybody loved Isabella NC. So they all named their kids that. And then you have the fact that John Peter Hart and Isabella NC are actually first cousins. That makes it even more complicated. And so uh, several years ago, I think it was like three or four years ago, I sat down and I said, there's something wrong with this and I'm not sure what it is. And I started to try to untangle it. And that's where I say she really taught me a lot. I learned about how um, every little piece of information that you add to that vital information helps separate and make a person unique and distinct. So let's go on. So we're going to look at her person page. This is her. And um, you can see it brings up the, the, the vital information page. Um, you can go to family tree, to person, and then to uh, details to see your own person page. And then I want to bring it in a little bit closer and say, okay, so see all these um, topics across the top. Those are like tabs. So if you were to turn those sideways and think of it as a notebook, those would be the main topics that you're going to find for any individual. And then under there, each one of their, them, each one of those sections will have their own uh, sections underneath it. In this case, for details, we have life sketch, vitals, other information, and family members. So as I talk tonight, because I'm focusing mostly on vital information, but this other information is where you're going to add those other things that don't fit into vital information, but that make up that person and their his history and historical information. And anything that I talk about in the vital information will actually apply in the other information too when it comes to dates and places. So. Let's go back and we're going to look. So if I click on vitals and so see the little arrows, that anytime you see arrows on family search, that means it's going to open or close something. I like keeping everything open because I just like seeing it all. But occasionally people will close it and then they can't see it and can't figure out where it is. So I want you to know that anytime you see an arrow, that's what it means. In this case, now they made some big changes. Um, I don't know that it's as easy to read as it was before, but it is actually a little bit more clear. So I understand the intention of the programming behind this. So when you look at the name, you can see it used to be that you would click on the name to edit it and open it up. And it wasn't always clear to people, like, where do I click? What do I do? Now they put it all right there so you see the name. And then you can see what sources support that information because that's what's tagged to the name. There are 10 sources that support the information for her name. And then there's the edit. Now the edit is part, and, the, and you'll see it's for every um, part of this, um, has an edit portion of it. So you can change those items individually. Now, is everybody familiar with what is a hyperlink? Or I should say, who doesn't know what a hyperlink is? Everybody knows what a hyperlink is. Nancy, thank you. So a hyperlink is something, it's always in this different color of blue. So you'll have a whole page of information, and then you'll see these blue things. That means you can click on it and another window will open. And that's and they call it hyperlink because it links to something else. So in this case, I click on edit for Isabella N.C. Higginbotham and it brings up this um, dialogue is what they call it. And this allows me to start making changes to the information there. And you can see, I'm going to bring it up a little bit bigger. You can see that there's one person watching. I'm the person watching. On the top front page, on the person page, there's a little star on everybody's person page. And if you click that star, you're watching it. And the more people who click those stars, the more people are watching it. And I pay attention to how many people are watching a record that I'm going to make a change in because if there's 50 people watching it, I'm going to be so careful. Because <laughs> I'm going to assume that somebody knows more than I and they really care to keep an eye out on it. Um, so just be aware of that, that that's, that's kind of an important feature. The next thing that they add is so that you can see that there are 12 contributors to this record. So since I created this record to clean it up, because that's what I had to do, Isabella was so confused with so many Isabellas that I just created a fresh record for her. Um, 12 people have contributed to this record since then. They have either attached a source, they have changed a date or a place, or changed a name or something about it. And that's great because I know that there's at least 12 people who care about Isabella like I do, hopefully. So now um, next you'll see there's an other button. I'm not going to go into that, but that's how you would add things in other languages. And if you get to that point, come back and see me and I'll give you more detail. But um, you can add names in other languages. I don't do it very often, so I'm not going to cover it tonight because I don't think you will either, but, um, but there is need for it, so that I want you to know where it is. 
Notice in the first names field it has her first names, Isabella Incy, and then in the last name field we have Higginbotham. Now, again, I've gone into records that have been brought into FamilySearch from a long time ago or have been in there a long time, and when I, you can't see it from the, the initial screen on the page, um, the first page, but when I go into edit, I can see that sometimes the last name is actually in the first name field, or there's a, a middle name in the last name field, and guess what that's going to do? It's going to make it harder for the computer to find the information in the records. So, so if you ever see that, go in and change that. And then I have an explanation here in the case I was cleaning up this record, so I wanted everybody to be very clear that I knew exactly what I was doing when I put her name in and I put her with her husband, is that she was, she married her first cousin, John Peter Hart. And that, um, that explanation stays there until somebody makes another change, at which point they can keep that explanation or they can delete it and add another one. And anything that you put in that field will stay in the change history. So you can see why somebody does something. Sometimes I leave what they have because it's so much better than I was going to write. But I might add something else and then put my initials after it. Or I might um, just leave it because it was good and then sort of I feel like I take credit for it, which may be bad. I don't know. But that's how they've chosen to do it. And you can see that I was the one who made that change um, when I created that record. And then this see all changes is really critical. I use that extensively to see how somebody has evolved and how their name might have changed. If I think something's wrong, the first thing I'm going to do is go look through the change history to see were there any changes. Like Beth, you were here, we were looking at one of her relatives and immediately I was drawn to, wait a minute, there's some other names in there. I would be going to the change history to see when did that name get introduced, how did, because it, it clearly didn't belong there after we looked at the records. And I could see in the change history when that happened. The next thing that I want to draw your attention, now, Family Search or Family Tree, the, I, I like to go to their programming kind of classes, the people who develop it, to see what they're thinking. And one thing that they have said, if you've ever worked in Ancestry, you know that you can go in and change names, add um, dates, places at will as you're attaching the records. It's a little bit harder in Family Search. And they did that for a reason. They said they wanted you to look at all of the information, all of the names, and then go in and make a, a decision. They didn't want you to just make changes on the fly. I can respect that. As long as I understand why they do it, I'm okay with that. So the funny thing about this is you can see Isabella has all these different spellings in her name. You never see NC there because that's more in the family records. Maybe even, maybe even now if I keep scrolling down, you can see there's a scroll bar here. But in um, but this first record I thought was really interesting because Hookalash does not look like anything like Higginbotham, right? So I said, well, I'm going to just go look at this record. And I look at this, and the maiden name of the mother is Isabella Hukalash. Except that as I looked a little bit closer, I think it really is H-I-C-K-A-B-O-T-H-M. I think it was really hard to read. It was spelled more phonetically than the way it was traditionally spelled in the family. But it still represented the same person. It's not something I'm going to add as an alternate spelling of her name, because that's the only record where it shows up that way. No, it's not going to probably be found any other time that way. So, um, but it's interesting to note and to make and understand if there's an exception that you make note of that and understand why the record is the way or why it is that way. Oops, let me go back. No, that's later. Okay. So there are some unique cases such as adoptions, name changes, and foreign names. Um, for example, I mean, I've been adopted, my name's changed so many times, and legally, I can pick several names, right? So um, how you handle that is a little bit more complex, but just keep in mind, try to keep that original birth name, if possible, or their legal name in the birth name field in the vital information, and then use any other alternate names. Um, my husband's grandfather was
way and in another language. My, my niece, her dad, um, is from Iran, so they have the Persian, and they don't even actually have, you can't even enter the Persian name in um, family search yet. So, so there, there are some things that may make it harder. Hopefully you're not um, approaching that yet, but just know that there are ways to handle those. So I talked about a little bit about databases and standardizing, and I don't want to scare anybody off, but I had to show this. Um, a programmer is an organism that turns caffeine and pizza into software. Now, I had to laugh because <laughs> I thought it was kind of funny about the time that family search is really going into full swing, and there's a lot of hard programming going on that it's now okay to drink Diet Coke. I'm just saying I think it's kind of funny, but <laughs> maybe coincidental now. Um, but my, my daughter is a programmer. And um, my husband does systems, and my other daughter is a librarian. And so after years of being exposed to them, I now cannot think of anything not in a system-like way. And family search, and because of that, I think it's really helped me be very successful in understanding how family search works, because I'm thinking from a, the programmer standpoint. I'm thinking from how does it work as a system as opposed to how do I make them do it the way I want it. I do it the way they want it because then they'll do help me and it'll make my um, work a lot easier. So when I was a kid, I loved matching games. I did. I'd play memory games forever. And it looked a lot like that probably. I got a little older and thought I'd better get a little healthier. But you understand, it's basically just matching. You're finding what things match each other. As I got older, I went and I started liking Mahjong. It's a lot more complicated, right? There's a lot more to look at. Um, I could see that this matches part of that, but not entirely. The top part doesn't match the bottom part. That's a little bit like family search. Um, maybe you have a date that matches, but not the place. Or you have the place that matches, but not the date. So we're trying to find elements that match and decide, are they the same? And in this case, this is the one that matches where both things match identically. So you're saying, well, how does that matter with what we do? So I'm taking you behind the scenes a little bit. Um, think about family search, ancestry, any of these things are systems, and they have criteria that they have to program in and say, if I could go out and find a record for you, what am I going to decide that, how do I decide that that's a record that matches the person that you're trying to match? And how do I say that this person is a duplicate of that? They have to figure something out. And I started thinking about that. And with the help of somebody who attended a class when I was talking about it one time, I realized that they actually have a point system. Now, I don't know exactly what the point system is, but I do know that if something matches exactly, they give, let's just say, two points. button over here that says you can export those results. And that is one of the coolest things. And I don't think I could have solved the mystery that was Isabella Incy and John Peter Hart without being able to export the results that I found. All the variations and which ones fit the criteria I was looking at. So if you export it into a spreadsheet, what happened was is I put in Isabella Incy, Higginbotham, and then her birth year. And then it gave it a score. Aha, so if they do score it somehow, right? They're giving points. You can notice the highest score it got with those, that matching criteria was 4.129. And it brought up that, yes, we think this is her birth date of 1854. So the top one is probably the best one, right? And then you can see that there's all variations of everything else that came. So then I, t I did another search, only this time I put in the death year and the given name of John Peter and then um, the surname of Hart. Then see what happened. This score jumped to 6.5 for all of the top ones, or 6.37, and then dropped down to the threes and twos and ones. What's interesting about this is you can see that with that criteria, there was a Isabel I. Higginbotham who married a John P. Hart in 1876. Justin Isabel married a John P. Hart in 1871. Huh. Two marriage dates, five years apart. Hmm. That led me to think they were two different people with, oddly, coincidentally, the same names. Until I realized that, no, they were first cousins. Family didn't like it too much. They had a couple of kids. They divorced. He went off and married a girl named 
Kinky Posey Pravat. Can you even believe that's a name? I love this story just so I can say those names. <laughs> okay, Pinky Posey Pravat. So Pinky has a couple of children. The first one dies. I can find no record of her, but I do have um, some evidence of her. The second girl is living, but the mother dies right after she's born. So John Peter Hart says, I'm still in love with my first wife. I only divorced her because nobody liked it, but I'm, I don't care anymore. He goes back to his first wife, but first wife's not going to take the, the baby. So this baby goes and lives with her maternal parents, grandparents. Okay? He goes back to his wife. They remarry in 1876, which gives you the second marriage, and they have like six more kids. Okay, that, now I can understand where all the confusion comes from, and it's the South, I'm just saying, it is the South, okay? So, anyway, so in, in solving that, part of it was getting the dates right and the places, making sure that I had all the correct information for everybody that I was looking at. And again, if you go back and look at entering standardized dates and places and family tree, they'll give you some information. Um, James Tanner is really great. He uh, does a lot of webinars for BYU um, Family History Library on YouTube. I, I, I consider watched every one of them, but I watched a lot of them, and I really respect him. He's very good at what he does, and he's the first one who really, I felt, explained standardization and how it works in family search um, to the best. And so he has a blog. Um, that links to it from that um, page on the FH guide, so you can get there from there. And here is this. But he also has a webinar, and if you just Google James Town or BYU, um, BYU Family History YouTube, it, it, his stuff will all come up. I just subscribe to it so that I'm notified. But he goes through this step-by-step -step how standardization works, and I love it because I learned a lot from him. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this date? So you're, if you're chuckling, I know you get it, right? Yeah. And have any of you ever come across a date like that in Family Search and you go, oh, my word. Yeah, because it could be interpreted as April 5th, 1965, or May 4th of 1865, or 1765, or 1665. You know what I'm saying? So how you enter dates really makes a difference as to whether we can understand it. In some parts of the world, like I just got some letters from Germany that I'm looking at, and I'm going, okay, is that, do they have the dates before, the months after, because they just separate it by periods, and I had to really think through that, and so we want to be as clear as we can, and so family search, this is the standard in family search, the single digit months, or double if it's, a, you know, greater than 10, the full month is spelled out, and the year is spelled out, and I think as I've looked at it, I think that was really wise of them. I sometimes wish the clerks at church would do this. Um, <laughs> because March sometimes gets confused with May. Um, other, you know, there's those shorter versions of them can sometimes, if you're not writing correctly, can be confused. So, so January, you cannot mistake for anything, right? But keep in mind that if you're working in Ancestry, their standard is the three-digit month. So that does, so when I'm working in there, I generally keep it to three digits just because I want their system to work better for me. So I want you to understand that. Now, if you don't know the exact or correct date, I, if you've worked with me, you know I use before almost 100%. 99.9%, I love before. I rarely use after, but I, I feel like before is the best thing because um, the computer is doing the work. The computer can search for dates before. If they're in a standardized format and you would write before such and such a date, it will look for any date before that that matches that criteria. The problem with using things like about is that it only looks within a general short range, like a few years before and after. So in my case, my family, my mom and dad, they, had, they have nine kids. If I estimate their birth on any one of us kids with an about, I'm only going to be right with maybe one or two, not with the rest of them. But if I say before, I'm going to be right with anybody, except for me because I was adopted and I was born way before she gave me birth. So there we go. So there are some exceptions, but even in the case where I was working with somebody and we used this before to help identify and locate some people, it still worked because even though the woman ended up being 15 years older than the husband, 
and we went and verified it over multiple censuses. We were able to define that because we used before for one of them, and it found the husband, which then led us to the wife on all the other records. So it, it really works, and I've been able to extend trees just using before uh, my estimation. I usually use 20 years for men um, at, before birth of a child or a marriage, and then 18 for women, unless it's Mexico, and then I drop it a little bit. Anyway, um, so then you can use things like from 1810 to 1820 if you have um, a specific time period. But again, I don't always rely on the records to be always 100% accurate. So I would still, even in that case, I use before 1820. I don't limit the computer to the search between those two dates. I want it to have more to look for. Um, if you only know the month and the year, then just go ahead and spell out the month and the year and put what you know. I have never in my life used BC, but I put it in there anyway just so you know I know it's there. Um, 29 of February is only standard for leap years, which I think is good, or most people understand. Unknown or dead. Have any of you come across that in the death field? Am I the only one? I come across it all the time. They write dead, unknown, whatever. Take it out. The computer doesn't recognize that as a date. <laughs> If they're in the system, they're dead, let's say, or they should be, right? So the computer, you hinder the searches if you put unknown. Is that it? So just don't use it or take it out when you see that. And then I don't like calculated. Calculated is something I found that a lot of genealogists in the past, they would say, well, 25 years is a, dec or is a, um, a generation. And that's how they would estimate it sometimes. You can, it is a standard, you can use it in family search, but then again, you're limited to that 1850 rather than if you were to say before 1855 and it does a wide sweeping search, now you're, you've pinned the computer down to a really finite search. So I just, if I see that they've calculated, I recalculate it and I say 25 is way too far, I'll say before 20 years instead of, you know, about 25. And again, all of a sudden, I'll start getting hints because I changed what the computer was looking for. So places is the next part of that, because when we're talking about all those events and things, we've got the dates and the places. So places is the next thing. And I really like them to be accurate and And I can look at it immediately. That's the first thing I do. I look at standardize it, standardize it. Place is wrong. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The very fact that you standardize that allow the computer to look. So, for example, we're here at Family History Center in a finite place. If I standardize any information, the computer knows. It'll look all throughout Sandy. It's going to start looking in Salt Lake County. How about let's just start for Utah. Then it's going to start in Arizona, Wyoming, Montana. It's going to start widening that if it understands that it's a place. So that's why I standardize everything. And then I will get to the information faster if I do that. So example here, historical places. We want to um, tie those in, uh, to a current place, which is called geotagging. And most of you are familiar with these. Um, little numbers here. So here we are at the Family History Center, and those are the numbers. Well, in Family Search, they are linking those historic names and places to a place on a map, just like that. They're giving them coordinates. They also do that for the records. So by making sure that you have that information in there the way that they can geotag it properly will allow it, the records to synchronize up, and they say, well, wow, if this record belongs to you, I think these rec other records, and they keep bringing you more records because of that. And again, it comes down to using it ver as a keyword versus a location. A keyword means, okay, it has to have granite in the name. But if I say it's granite, Salt Lake County, Utah, United States, it says, oh, it's got to be somewhere in Utah. That's a lot better for me. So here's an example of, let me just make sure I know what I'm doing here. Um, this is where you get to practice kind of thing. So if you open a residence or a place and you just type in that little uh, white space after it, this is a new thing that they did add. They now will put what you have typed in in this gray area below. Before you had to know to type somewhere else if you wanted to keep it the way it was. But now you don't have to do that. 
And then what they've done is they've taken the standardized places that they have in the system, and they have given you the dates for when that was this, the place. So in this case, this is Duval, Florida. And if I look up at the date of the residence, which is because of the census, I can see 1880. OK, it was, it was a county at that point. It was no longer in the to Florida territory. It was a county in actual Florida. And so that's going to be um, closer to, that's what I want to do, is try to get it for the time that it was. Now, when I teach my class on standardizing in a month, I, it'll kind of go beyond that. But this, but even if it was a territory or one or the other, it doesn't matter because they geotag to the exact same place. So just keep that in mind. But I still want it to be as accurate as I can. And so I'm going to put Florida because that's what it was, not the territory at that point. So dates and places and reasons are all connected to the birth, christening, and death and also burial, I guess, if you're um, looking at that. So, so what we're learning is all basically all of those same fields, and we're just going to apply it for all of those. So let's go back to Isabella NC, and I click on Edit, and I come down here, and you can see I've got this um, interesting dilemma. If you look at the date, it says 3rd of April, and I've made an explanation. It says I'm standardizing and adding the birthplace that had been in there because of a record. And I say, well, the date of the birth on the headstone is the I would expect it, or NC. It just has Mrs. Isabel I. Hart. Then I go down and I look at the death date. Yep, it says April 2nd, 1854. OK, who gave the information? It's her son. OK, my husband gave the clerk the wrong birth date for his daughter that was like a month old. Men sometimes mess it up, I'm just saying. OK, so I'm looking at going, OK, her son clearly made a mistake. He was grieving. I don't know. But he got he may have gotten it wrong. So I'm going to go, but I'm going to keep looking. Because here's the death date, and it's got her husband listed. So I know that that's, um, we are talking about the same person. So then the next thing I did is go look at the headstone. And clearly the headstone says April 3rd, 1854 is her birthday. Well, I happen to know the family. And they're exceptional genealogists. They have extensive records. They definitely know when it is. And they did not put money on that headstone without knowing what the date was, right? So I'm going to trust them. But that being said, just because it's written in stone does not make it true. Because on the other side of the family, they just paid good money to redo a whole headstone because it was wrong. So, But keep in mind, the death record was not the primary record for a birth. It was the primary record for a death. This, I know, the family put some time and thought and made sure it was correct. Now, it's funny because John Peter Hart, he's a twin. And his headstone says one thing, and the other twin says another thing. <laughs> so it's like there's this. So let's go back to Cell. And in case you that I am. OK, so I click on Edit. I bring this up here. I show you. I look at how many. I start to type in my standardized date. Um, if I press the space bar, drop down. Now notice the one in gray is what I've got, but the one that has the little calendar is what's standardized. And that's what I want to choose. And I always teach people choose from the drop down list because then it's going to standardize it for you and it's going to be in the correct format. Here I can see, well, Dismore, they don't have the date on there. I'm just going to pick the top one because it really doesn't matter, but it'll be um, close enough to geotag it to the right records. And then if I find out later, if I want to do the research, I can have it be um, the territory. And then all I said is I'm just standardizing and adding the first place. Um, and I, and there's that note that says, hey, there's, I understand that there's a difference between this. And hopefully if somebody came behind me and they saw that there was a few discrepant records, they would look through the history and see my explanation. And they would understand that that's why there's a difference. And so. Um, be good about your explanations when there is something that doesn't make sense or add up. That's the important thing. 
in this case, I'm going to click cancel so I didn't change anything. And then um, you can just look and, and you can see the little icon right next to it that shows that it's tagged to the right place. Now, let's go to Daniel Christopher. He's the son that actually gave the wrong birthday for his mother on the death certificate. Well, let's look at him. Now, it shows that he died in, or he was born in Florida, and he was buried in Seminole, Florida. So I could almost assume that he died there, too. I mean, he was buried there. He was born there. But I actually happen to know people who have died in other places, and then they bring their bodies back. It didn't happen quite as much in the 1800s, so I'm a little bit careful. But, but just keep in mind that you can't just assume that because somebody lived and died or was buried in the same place that they didn't die somewhere else and get carried there. Um, we know lots of people get buried up in Idaho that die in Utah or vice versa, right? So anyway, so let's go down though. What's interesting down here is somebody had entered a custom event. So remember I talked about the other information. This is where all the census records get attached and put the information in. But they added the cemetery down here. Well, I prefer to have the cemetery actually up in the burial information. So Let's go back up here and look at that and see if we can fix that. And I just have to make sure I have to just click on that one. Um, so in this case, nope, I'm going to go back, see if it'll work. Hold on. So in this case, I went in and I started to edit this. I started to type in the cemetery. And you can see it starts bringing up a drop-down list. If I went too far, it took it out, so I backspaced. And then it allowed me to click into the cemetery and add that as a place. And now the burial is really the burial at the exact cemetery. And then I just write in an explanation of that's what I'm doing, is that I'm adding the burial place. I can see that the find a grave index is right there um, showing up, but I could even go in and add you know, what the plot number is and all that. I see people do that, and I, I think it's great when people take the time to do that, and sometimes I actually do do that as well. And now when you come up here, you can see now that this, the cemetery is showing up there. Now, what's interesting is I like doing this too for, like, christening records, but you have to be careful because when you're doing, like, parishes, often they put it backwards. Like, you'll, you'll have a name and you'll think, well, this is the way it should go in, and you can't find the standard, but if you switch the names around, then all of a sudden it pops up in the standard list. So sometimes you do have to play around with it, or sometimes it doesn't show up because you're not spelling it correctly. And Family Search ain't Google. So if I have that happen, I usually take it and I paste it into Google and do a search on it, and they give me the correct spelling, and then I come back and paste it in, and then Family Search can find it. So um, that's just a little trick that I have learned over the years. But one thing that was really cool that they just added is this timeline. Have any of you noticed that timeline that they added? I love it. I'm so happy about that. And so if you go to, let's just make sure I do this right. So in the case, let's see. Nope, that's doesn't like my videos. I'm just going to say, let's do this. Okay, so in this case, um, Daniel Christopher Hart, I've added that burial. I actually did go in and add the year just so that it would show up in the timeline. Because even if you put a place in, if you don't have it in a date, it will not show up. But you can click on what you want to show, and you can remove or add. You can turn the map on or off. I love that. And then as you go down the list, you can click, and you can start to see where people have moved around um, throughout their life. They stayed pretty much in the same place. But as we get down to the birth of this child, you'll notice it's over on the other side of the state. And that's because it just says Florida. It doesn't actually have the city or even the county of where they were born. So that gives me an indication that I want to go in and see if I can find out. She's probably born in Seminole, I'm not going to lie. But I could go in and standardize that and fix that for that child to make it show up in the right place. And I think all of this, by seeing what the results of our their lives laid out on a map. Now, like I said, I had to go back in and I had to add 1933 for the burial to show up in the timeline. But I wanted to do that because I wanted to show you how cool this is when um, if I take that now, and also that you can edit right here at, if you had to. You don't have to go into another screen to edit. But what happens is that I come over here and I look at this and I start to scroll in, I can see where the cemetery is in relationship to the rest of the state and maybe where they live. And I can click it to So 
I just want to give you a little bit of one person from another, the spelling of a name. Now, spelling to me is like the least important because there's so many different spellings and it changes. And I want to be flexible because I'll miss something if I'm too rigid on that. But if I click on here, I'm going to just show you what I would do on this case. Look at the sources that are right there, and then just save and go on to the next thing. Here we go. Okay, now if I look at those record hints again, I see there's all these records that say Lenora Bell as her maiden name, and that they might have ch uh, children. So I want to check those things out, but I'm pretty confident because that one marriage record, if I open it up, it says her husband was William C. Tanner, and they were born or married in um, 1913, September. And I see that this record is pretty darn close. Same husband. I got to go change the marriage date. One was probably a bond date and the other one was the marriage date. So I actually just, I don't do a lot of typing. I cut and paste her name. And then I go over to the edit field in her name. And I'm going to add her name. Now, as soon as I typed that or pasted that, all of a sudden I'm looking at the sources on the right, which is this is why Family Search did it this way. They said, but look at all the sources. And I look at it and I go, you know what? I don't really, that's the only record where you see her name spelled with Leah Nora as opposed to Lenora. Everything else is Lenora. So I'm not going to change that yet unless I have a better reason to. But I, I'm okay. I'm comfortable with the, main, the middle name. So I'm just going to change the middle name and leave the rest alone. And then I go on. I can look. I could also go back and look at all the changes, but I'm just saying I'm, this is just listed on all the records that I can see attached, and I don't type very well. You can see I had a back and forth. It was on the marriage records. So I'm saying that's the one place where I saw it. And now when I go back up to her, now it shows her name is Lenora Bell Hart. And then I'll go and attach the records, but now I think, Guess, look at that. As soon as I did that, I standardized that and I added her name. Do you remember? I think there were only three hints before. Can you see that now there are seven hints? Just by making those few changes, now the computer says, oh, well, if that's the case, let me give you some more because you're helping me out. Now I know, I know who you're talking about, okay? So that's really the benefit of just taking a few extra minutes to do that. So in review, Think like a geek. Um, no, that's, you don't have to think like a geek, but do think about the system that you're working in. Think about how you put the information impacts, how the computer has to decide how to match it up and give it the best chance of matching up the information that it can get by putting it in the format that it likes and that they program for. Um, add the correct, add or correct vital information after you review the sources. Be sure to go in and add it. Sometimes in the past, people added a source, but they didn't actually move the information over. Sometimes, and I'm just lazy enough, I go detach it and reattach it and just move it over because I'm not going to go in and type it in. And then it stays attached to that record. Standardize information for better matching of sources, duplicates, and geotagging and mapping. And um, I just think things will only get better in the future and get more accurate as more people do this. Um, so. First of all, if you want to practice or if you have questions, I'm willing to stay after and answer some of those specific questions. Um, some people in the last class I taught wanted to know when the standardizing records was, so I um, looked it up and put it in here. So it's the end of October that I'll be teaching that. And that one is just it goes in a lot more in depth about standardizing and dealing with some of the real tweaky, fussy issues of standardizing. And so that's 
it. Does anybody have any questions? No, because I've worked with half of you and you've already heard my spiel, right? <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate that and you've been a great class and that's the end. And I survived being recorded for the first time, but we're going to stop it right now. <laughs>